Okay, so uh, I'll try and keep it short because the main purpose of today is, I guess, really to sort of listen to what everyone's, everyone's questions and, um, yeah. So I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the reason for retrofit, how we do it, talking a bit about um, a new standard in the UK for retrofit, um, and then talking about um, uh, the projects we're planning to undertake, uh, but then we'll, we'll talk about uh, questions and answers um, at the end. Uh, so a bit about the why, I mean, I think most people know why, uh, one of the biggest reasons why we need to um, retrofit our homes, but um, this is a graph from the Carbon Brief website showing carbon emissions uh, for the last uh, 40 years which have done nothing really but go up and um, in, uh, in the built environment, as it's called, in buildings, um, the, the situation's just as bad. Uh, so although we've been in gradually increasing our building standards, actually um, overall emissions from the built environment have gone up because we've still been building more buildings uh, and not improving existing ones. Um, so you know, there's a, a lot of um, been a lot of noise about this recently, I guess you could say, uh, where uh, you've had Insulate Britain and their campaign, um, and the government have been uh, working on various consultations. So the heating building strategy uh, was released last month um, from the Scottish government, and the heat and building strategy was released two weeks later by the UK government. Um, but unfortunately, these aren't really heading in the way they, they need to be going. Um, so, you know, I think there's, um, there, there is some government support out there, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, but, but I think really the way I'm, as, as Zero Carbon David, we're looking at it, is whether we can do things as a community um, that, that we couldn't do as individuals. <clears throat> Um, so, yeah, um, the bigger picture really on, on why we need to retrofit is, is the fact that in 2050, so this magic date when we've got to be net zero, 80% um, of the buildings that will exist then already exist now. So, uh, you know, we can't, we can't build our way out of the climate change problem. Um, you know, on a local level, you know, as someone who's retrained from being an engineer into uh, being an architect, I, I'm absolutely shocked at the terrible quality of buildings in this country. Uh, you know, they, they might they might look nice, but the performance of, of, of our building stock over the generations is is just shocking. So, 45% of the homes in Aberdeen and Aberdeen Shire have no wall insulation whatsoever. Uh, and if you were down at the end of the hall there with me asking you questions today, I was asking. Uh, people whether they spend more than 10% of their household income on, on heating their home, uh, which is the Scottish definition of fuel poverty, and 25% of um, Scot Scotland, Scottish homes are in what's called fuel poverty. Um, so that's the kind of local context, um, but there's also um, the case of just the physics of it, how does it add up? So. We can't also get away from the fact that renewable heating systems don't supply as much heat as fossil fuel based heating systems. Uh, you know, it's heat pumps versus boilers, basically. Um, so uh, if you're going to go and switch your home from a, an oil boiler to, a, to an air source heat pump tomorrow um, without first sort of checking the energy demand of the house, uh, you know, your insulation and all that sort of thing, then there's a possibility that you're either that you're going to be cold and that your heating bills are actually going to go through the roof and you could end up in fuel poverty. Um, and I'm, I've seen that happen with people who are really well intentioned and they want to get off fossil fuels. They've gone in and installed a heat pump um, and then they'll want, you know, their, their electricity bill is through the roof. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a really good reason why Insulate Britain are following the campaign they're following. And that's because lots of Good solid research shows that insulation is the most cost-effective 
way of dealing with uh, climate change in buildings. So, you know, it doesn't go wrong. Uh, you install it once. Um, it, so, insulating first is, is is the way to go. It's what is being called in the industry a fabric first approach. So, um, then we need to start thinking about how how um, how far can you go with this, like. So uh, some people may have heard about the passive house standard. I've uh, probably bored some people in this room to tears with it already. Um, and passive house buildings consume 90% less energy than most. Um, and you, to retrofit an existing building to that standard is, is, is very difficult. It's not impossible. Um, but it, it's just, I've put this graph up just to really show you that, um, you know, this figure here of 308 is um, probably the average sort of energy consumption for um, homes built before 1980 around here. Um, I know my house was, at least, was more like 450 when I first got it. Uh, and, you know, by doing a couple of measures like some insulation and, and maybe fitting double glazing, you can bring it down a little bit. But um, to actually get it down to levels where a heat pump will work and um, uh, you know, you're, you're not struggling to heat the home, uh, you need a combination of measures. Um, and that's, so that's where we're talking about what's called a, a whole house approach. You have to look at the building holistically and, and try and build them all in together. Um, so yeah, we need to just apply a bit of physics, basically. Um, but obviously there's some benefits. There's, we can lower our energy bills, we can be more comfortable in our homes, um, we can improve our indoor air quality. So classic problem in, in our neck of the woods is uh, houses that are built with trickle vents in windows and extractor fans in bathrooms. That's, that, the reason you have that is to get rid of moisture from your buildings. Um, but that causes uh, problems in winter when, of course, you tend to close all those little trickle vents and the moisture then has nowhere to go. And it's not just moisture, you're talking about uh, airborne particulates from furniture, from cooking uh, and things like this. So um, there are other ways of doing it, which I can talk a bit more later, but um, in improving indoor air quality uh, can, be, can be really, can add a lot of uh, value to your, to your life. Um, you could be making your home more valuable and you're hopefully making it more resilient. So if your home at the moment has surface condensation perhaps on windows that's causing problems or, or maybe not just on windows, by dealing with all these little problems properly uh, we can eliminate internal uh, damp and mold uh, which means you don't have to, you know, your building's in a better condition, it should need less maintenance. Um, other benefits, of course, we lowering our carbon footprint. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think there's also something to be said, um, depending on your outlook, about a, a kind of community approach. Um, you know, I'd like to be part of a scheme myself personally, where um, as a community we're working towards this goal of, 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 of decarbonising um, all our homes. But um, yeah, I know, I know it's going to come up as a discussion point, but payback is, is a difficult argument with what we're talking about here in terms of um, whole house retrofit. Uh, but there is research uh, been done in the industry that shows that uh, a deeper retrofit, as they call it, so reducing your energy by, say, 70%, um, is more likely to give you a payback. It's more likely to add to your house value um, it, there's, there's benefits to going uh, for a, a more well insulated, lower energy home. Um, so we kind of know that to get to where we want to be, we need to do um, what is called deep retrofit, uh, but there are risks associated with it and attention to detail is important. So. There have been projects that have run previously which have run into what are called unintended consequences. So these could be uh, damp mold and condensation, it could be problems with ventilation that cause stale air, or in even worse situations, 
uh, insulating projects in the past have even led to structural problems, and we don't want to do that. Uh, but fortunately, the government commissioned a review into this uh, six years ago called the Bonfield Review, uh, which looked at multiple uh, projects where things had gone wrong, and it told the industry to learn its lessons. And the result of that was uh, this report, which recommended um, a new quality mark, which has been called Trust Mark, kind of like Kite Mark. Everyone remembers the Kite Mark was on things. This is called Trust Mark. Um, which was to provide a consumer charter, a code of conduct for the industry, uh, and codes of practice. And so all that has been combined into a new standard uh, for whole house retrofit, um, which um, is, it, it is, is excellent. Um, so it is, it's, it's still very new, uh, but the key thing is it puts the occupiers of the building, not necessarily the homeowners, so if you rent your home, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, it puts the occupiers at the centre of the project, um, and every project gets uh, a dedicated what's called retrofit coordinator, someone who oversees the work and quality controls and checks, basically. It's all about checking that something's been put in correctly. Um, and this scheme is, this new standard is basically adopted in lots of government schemes going forward. Um, and just to explain a little bit about the this new process. Um, so <clears throat> there's a, an introductory phase um, where the uh, retrofit coordinator meets with the householders to come up with what they call uh, their uh, intended outcomes. So they come up with a list of why they want to retrofit their home. So it could be, oh, I want to reduce my bills, it could be, I'm cold, it could be a combination of things. But it's setting out why that, what, what the purpose of the retrofit project is. From then on, a, a detailed house survey is done. So that goes beyond. So lots of people have probably had EPCs done in their homes. A lot of times these days, the guys who write EPCs, they don't even visit the house. They do it remotely. But this is a detailed survey uh, that should include thermal imaging, checking that things like extractor fans are working. It's just a detailed approach to doing a house survey. Um, and then there's a, a retrofit assessment, which basically looks at all the options of how that retrofit could be done, all the different measures. And then an improvement option evaluation is, is provided. So that says, right, these are all the things you can do. Wall insulation, loft insulation, new windows, a ventilation system, let's say. And then it details the, um, the cost of each measure and the payback of each measure, and also uh, a figure called carbon cost effectiveness, which is uh, you know, how much carbon you're saving for every pound you're putting in. But then the most important part of this is what's called a medium term retrofit plan. So this medium term retrofit plan is in medium term, it means roughly 10 years. And it's basically taking all these in improvement options and putting them in a plan. And it may be that some householders are really ambitious and they want to do everything tomorrow and get it done in a one hour, and that's fine. Uh, but most people probably want to do it in stages over a number of years. But it's important, and this new standard lays it out, that certain measures are done in a certain order. Um, and so it's following this fabric first approach of doing insulation first, and then things like uh, renewables and changing the boiler at a later date. So the medium term retrofit plan is, 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 is really key. And of course, once you've got that, the, you can get your contractors to design the improvements, carry them out. Um, but the other really important thing about this new standard is what's called monitoring. So uh, this ensures that the retrofit coordinator comes back uh, at the end of the job and a year after that um, to basically check that the client's outcomes have been met and there's no problems. Uh, and if there are any problems, there's a procedure for how they're rectified. Uh, but the other really important thing about this is that all these, all these documents, all these energy assessments, the medium term improvement plan, are also registered in the national database. And that means that A, it never gets lost, and B, if the house changes ownership, then the, um, 
The database has obviously got that information for the next owners and they can see what has and hasn't been done. Um, but also, I think most crucially, it's giving the surveyors something to look at. And this should hopefully mean that surveyors start including energy efficiency measures in their valuations much more, which may be a, you know, a, a, an appealing thing for, uh, for some of you. So, um, you know, we're not a, a, the, alone in, in looking at this. Um, so there are people using the standard already, and these are two organisations down in England, Carbon Co-op based in Manchester, Retrofit Works based in, in London, um, and they are cooperative, so not-for-profit, who are basically interfacing uh, installers, so, you know, plumbers, joiners, electricians, installation installers, they're, they're matching them with um, homeowners. So uh, are they kind of act as a facilitator, making sure that work is carried out correctly. Um, they help with funding. Uh, they also help train uh, the workmen in the new standards. Um, and there's big schemes happening. So uh, Carbon Co-op are working on 100,000 homes in Manchester and Retrofit Works are doing something similar in London and Oxford. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it, it, it's, there's experience from others and a network of people that we can learn from uh, in, in doing this. Um, so I guess what I just wanted to talk quickly about uh, the, the home retrofit plan. What's the plan for the Daviot project? Well, um, initially, you know, like, like anything, we've got this, this curve of, of, of people who will have some people who are innovators some of you are probably sitting in the room, hopefully. Then I'll have some early adopters, and then you know the majority of people will, will wait till later on. Um, so, um, but what I like, so what what I'm trying to do is write a plan that kind of um, agrees with that, because um, the market will develop better for this as well over time. Uh, but at the moment, David, as a our constituency boundary, we have 450 homes with an average EPC of D. Um, and I have uh, applied to the Vattenfall Fund and uh, been granted £2,000 to conduct uh, what I'm calling a feasibility study. So um, stage one here, where um, for that £2,000, we have a, a specialist company of architects in um, Glasgow called John Gilbert Architects, who specialise in energy efficiency. Uh, they've done pilot projects for um, the COP26 event and um, they help with um, writing some of the government guidance and things like that. Um, so they're really experts in their field and uh, they will be coming to Davia to survey three homes and to basically go away and uh, write a medium term improvement plan for the, those three houses. Uh, and the idea of this is that it will cover three different house types uh, because some of us live in farmhouses, some of us live in timber frame. Um, so the idea is to give everyone in the community some idea of what whole house retrofit looks like for their house. Uh, so the report would be shared with everyone in the community. Um, so uh, that's the plan for this initial tranche of uh, funding. Um, so I'm looking for likely volunteers today. Uh, <clears throat> stage two, I think beyond that at the moment, um, so the Mattenfall uh, Fund um, has a small grant and a large grant, and uh, my plan there is we got the small grant for this, the large grant is 30,000, um, and I think to, to do that energy assessment and the retrofit plan is probably about 1,000 or 1,500 pounds. So uh, I would like to then provide, um, see if we could get more people interested and get medium term improvement plans for at least 10, maybe 15 homes in the village, uh, in the community. Uh, and from there to try and actually do some pilot projects. Um, and then once we really get rolling, perhaps we can start looking at um, mass retrofit and economies of scale that would make it cheaper for everyone. Uh, but obviously that's a long way down the line. 
Um, so yeah, John Gilbert Architects is the, the, they run this thing called the Hab Lab, um, which is all about retrofit and um, uh, yeah. Um, please have a look at their website or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's that's. I'll stop there. That's about all I wanted to talk about for now. Um, and yeah, just uh, I welcome your questions. Have we got any volunteers? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of low hanging fruit as well that, that you can help in reducing bills. People seem to ignore it, but if you walk around your house with a candle or you know, you can, you can find all the drafts in your house on a windy night. And there's probably 30 percent improvement to be had just by just by limiting airflow through wall sockets and around window frames and doors and things like that. But the problem we have with an old house and it does need a bit of ventilation to keep it from getting damp. When we when we moved in, two of the rooms had damp walls because it hadn't been heated for a while. Or, yeah. You know, it's it's a stone built built building with, with planes and no wall insulation. Yeah. It's had extra insulation put on the ceiling. But the, in the old houses, the the felt leaks and then the slate rattle and the, the air exchange in the attic is quite high. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether it's actually worth, you know, tearing all the lining out and tearing the slates off and reshelving and, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Whether or not we're going to make a big improvement doing the, the deep retrofit, or whether we should just look at the, you know, where we can add insulation most effectively. So from, from, from my point of view, I think if we're going to achieve uh, net zero, we can't just do a little bit of insulation there and a little bit of insulation there. You have to have a measured approach. You know, there's no, to my mind, there's no point in putting insulation in if you don't know how much energy it's going to save you. And I totally take your point on ventilation. So um, another part of this standard says that if you insulate, you must ventilate. The reason you get condensation on internal surfaces is because um, if you typically, if you if you add insulation to a home, you are increasing the internal temperature. You're achieving your goal, which is great. Um, but that basically is allowing the air to hold more moisture. So relative humidity, it's called. Um, so if that air can now hold more moisture and it touches a surface somewhere that's still cold because it hasn't been insulated, then that's where you get surface condensation. So that's where all the detail of having a complete whole rack of insulation becomes really important. But the other thing about um, moisture is that ventilation can be a huge problem solver. So um, in London, uh, as part of the development of this, um, of this project, of this new standard, there was a, a project in London called Thamesmead, which was a 1960s concrete built collection of a thousand homes. And it was notorious for being a dreadful place to live because it was all concrete walls and most of the apartments had some form of damp or mold condensation in them. And the author of the technical standard, Peter Rickaby, went in and led the project. And they essentially, they didn't insulate any of the houses in the project, they just added ventilation and they eliminated damp and mould from every or every one of the thousand houses. So, you know, it may not have reduced their energy bills, but at least it made their indoor air quality better. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very bad to live in a house with mould, you know, the spores mm -hmm. floating around, asthma and things like that, I'm sure, so, you know. Um, so yeah, and the other, so yeah, you said 30% there, well I, did, I totally agree with that. This, so this is the software I use for energy assessment, the passive house software. On the left we have the energy losses, on the right we have the energy gains. And these coloured bars mean different things. This is a house in Daviot, um, which was part of my dissertation a couple of years ago. Um, and on the left, the losses we have here, in blue is, was the roof, in brown was the floor. Um, the yellow was their windows, and the green was what's called ventilation losses. So that is drafts uh, and things like that. So in this case, it was you know near fifty percent. So um, yeah, ventil yeah, 
it can be a huge loss. You're absolutely right. Matt, just a, a question on that um, particular uh, type was the block well insulated? Um, I think it had one layer of insulation in it as opposed to the industry standard of two. So, yeah, this was a 1970s bungalow in the centre of the village. Okay, because it's quite surprising to me anyway to see that over half the losses are to ventilation. Yeah. Why? Yeah. yeah. Few houses, Matt. If I go into Inverurie just now, in the Malcolm Malcolm Allen house. Mm -hmm. Brand new house, surely it's been built to the highest <laughs> standards. In which case, why is it that out back they have heat, an air source heat pump? And when you go into the cupboard inside, they've got a gas water? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there are uh, so many flaws with the existing um, system. Um, so. The, the energy assessment is done under what's called SAP, uh, which is the, soft, the, 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 the method that produces the EPC for you. Mm -hmm. But that system was developed in 2009. Uh, it was updated in 2012. And it was basically designed to tell people energy costs. Not, it, it's not accurate. It has loads of flaws in it. And there's silly things that happen where if you, to get the EPC better, Installing a gas boiler is better than installing an electric boiler under the EPC system. Uh, it's, there's some really screwy things that go on, but to say about the standard of building for a Mount Malham house, uh, no. I mean, yes, the, the, there are decent levels of insulation in modern homes now, um, but there are three levels of standard within the Scottish building regs. You have bronze, silver and gold. Um, a gold house still has twice the energy consumption of a passive house. And a bronze house is, is um, if I go back to uh, that graph, a bronze house is probably somewhere around between 150 and 200 on this, on this scale here. So. But why are we allowing people to build houses for that? I totally agree. I mean, yeah. they're going to have to be insulated. Yeah, but every house being built today will need to be retrofitted to meet yeah. their zero. Every home, yeah, it's shocking. It's, it's, it's just business. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it's yeah. Yeah. always been my life. Yeah. Um, it comes down to money. Yeah, and people. I mean, I've got an experience of building a, a building that um, um, when they did the EPC, they couldn't actually. There the was things they didn't understand because we've got heat recovery. We've got the buildings completely sealed uh, and we've got great insulation. We do have a gas boiler, but we, we've used so little gas, yeah. it almost makes no difference. Yeah. But they couldn't cope with our, they couldn't do an EPC on our building. Yeah. They, they're not ready for anything like that. And a council doesn't actually know how to rate it. Honestly, it, 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 as I say, it shocks me how bad it's got. It's terrible. The EPC system has been under review for the last four years. Um, it was uh, we thought it would be due the fix for it would be this year. It's not. It's going to be next year. Um, so yeah, there's things we can do beyond that. I think. I think the people, the community like this, doing things like this is helping because yeah, you know everything will take a long time to change. I mean, the more people get involved, it will change quicker. And the Scottish Government have said they, they're not, because there's loads of architects campaigning saying we should change the Scottish building rates to be passive our standard for new build tomorrow. The Scottish Government won't do that. It's going to be incremental over the years. It's, yeah, it's Sorry, there was a question at the back. Yeah, I just wanted to ask what local, I guess, local as an agriculture experience is with retrofitting, because from that previous talk that we had in retrofit, it seems a lot of the issues they had came down to the way things were installed and the experience and everything, but is the experience there really to actually do it properly or are there only like two companies that do it a lot in situations? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, for installers, there's this other standard called PASS 2030. There are no PASS 2030 installers in North East Scotland at the moment, other than big companies like Everwarm who are doing the contracts for the council and stuff like that. But um, 
we're gonna, uh, I'm, I'm making efforts with one of our local councillors has showed a real interest in this, in trying to actually um, start talking to, uh, yeah, contractors around and just saying, uh, you know, look, would you be interested in training up on this or, or whatever, but I mean, I'm, so I'm currently doing a, a deep retrofit project for um, uh, someone who lives in a granite uh, end terrace villa in King Street in Aberdeen. And it's been very hard to find contractors. And the contractors I got on site didn't really understand, they couldn't get their head around the fact that the client wanted to get rid of their gas boiler. You know, that's the attitude. Um, yeah, it just seems like but, if you're spending yeah. potentially a lot of money doing it, the last yeah. thing you want is someone who doesn't really know what they're doing and then you're yeah. in a sense of works then. So the key to it is this retrofit coordinator. It's someone who quality checks it and knows how things should be done. It's, it's really detailed in the standard. It says basically as soon as any work starts, the retrofit coordinator holds a toolbox talk on site with all the contractors, makes sure that the materials being delivered are exactly what they should be. And it's that, you're right, there's, at the minute in the, in the industry, there's no quality control, there's no compliance. Um, requirements at all. So. And are there quite a few then? Are you a retrofit? Um, I've, I've, I've done it, um, but I'm the only one in North East Scotland at the minute. So, okay. um, yeah, it just seems like there aren't that many options for people available. Not all of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can get people uh, from other parts of Scotland, like John Gilbert Architects, to come up here, and, and I'm sure they would work on projects like this um, up here, but um, to my mind, we need to build the local skill pools as well. So. I was just going to say something about the heat exchanges. That might be the problem solver for the ventilation because it, there's some very good heat exchanges now where you can you can prep the heat out of the air before you exhaust it and then warm the incoming air, put it in on the And they, they yeah. should to be very cost effective and very low in cost. Yeah, so um, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery is, is, an, is not an option for every house because you need to. Uh, a lot of the systems you have to have a ducted vent to every room, but it's it's what Passive House uses, and you know there's a lot of misconceptions about. I'm a Passive House designer, so I understand the specification really well. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about them being airtight boxes, but the reason um, a Passive House is an airtight box is because that green bit of the graph uh, is almost basically non-existent on a Passive House. Um, uh, but it brings fresh outdoor air and pumps it into every room. Uh, and it takes the stale air from bathrooms and kitchens, recovers the heat and pumps it out. So it recovers, and it, they're amazing. They recover 90, 85 to 90% of the heat from the outgoing air is transferred to the indoor um, air. So they're, they're amazing systems. There's some decentralized systems coming on the market as well, which is making it a bit more suitable for retrofit. Um, but yeah, it's a real shame Ken Gordon isn't here today, because those of you who know Ken, he's probably bored you to tears with it already, but he did a deep retrofit on his house. He fitted mechanical ventilation with heat recovery, silent system in his house. And he says the difference from one day to the next was day and night in terms of air quality and just the, the fresh air in the house. Yeah. My, it's, it's, you what, can, it's what we have and it makes the biggest difference, I think. But you do have to control, so you can't have, you, you can't have a lot of air getting into the building uh, from other sources. It has to come through the heat exchanger. Yeah. Uh, but um, we, we, we keep the same temperature. We have to use so little heating. Yeah. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing to do. And it's not the cost of that is not huge putting it into a new building. No, uh, it's, 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 it's more. It's, there's more cost than you. It's about the same price as a gas boiler, but um, yeah. You know, it costs to run it as well. What it matters to is all, all the, I probably do need to check the settings to make sure that that's made as efficient as it could be. But and change the filters. And change the filters, that, yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm on that eight there, but then. But combined with underfloor heating as well, it is phenomenal. No, no, no condensation, yeah. no electricity bills. Yeah, so the key to no mold and condensation is also about what we about this detailing of junctions where where two pieces where two elements meet, 
So you say it could be a wall and a window, or a wall and an eave and a roof. Uh, you always get uh, what's called a thermal bridge, or a cold bridge, some might call it. And careful detailing in those points is important, and that's one of the requirements of the new standard. Do you have, I know it's different for every house, but like ballpark figures for it, maybe if it's a, yeah. I don't know, it's an old farmhouse that's three bedroom, you know, just some examples of how much it costs. Yeah, you. so for a deep retrofit on an old house, um, the figures that get bounded around are sort of 60 to 70,000. Um, so it's a, it's a big investment. Um, and the fund, any funding for that or anything? So you get funding for some of it, but this is part of the problem at the moment is that, uh, for example, the renewable heat incentive uh, was um, for things like air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. And that funding um, system is coming to an end in the new year. Um, we don't yet know from government what it's going to be replaced by. Um, there are grants for things like loft insulation from Home Energy Scotland, and we have the Home Energy Scotland leaflets here today if you want to uh, fill one out for your own home. Um, but uh, yeah, won't always cover things like new windows or, or whatever. Uh, there, there is loans, but, but I, I would also say that um, uh, so the Construction Leadership Council uh, put together. Um, a, a proposal for a national retrofit strategy and that looked at all these issues you know cost disruption all, all these things um, and that's where it, 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 it comes to this conclusion that a deep retrofit saving 70 percent on energy is worthwhile and it also says that you know it should be fair so people in fuel poverty and this toes the government line as well people in fuel poverty will get uh, assistance for it. And you see these uh, in external wall insulation projects happening all over Aberdeen. That's that funding doing that. Um, those who can afford it should pay for it. But things like um, government finance being made available uh, would kind of, it, it, it's back to that bell curve of once we get enough people in, in, in interested, uh, you know, and there's more people working in the sector and more materials in, in greater volume, the costs should come down. But at the moment, um, yeah. yeah. It just seems like the RHI scheme, like, they essentially pay you for using electricity, whereas yeah. they could be using, like, instead of giving someone 30 grand over seven years to use electricity, they could use the 30 grand to help you use less energy rather than... It's a broken system. It's good at sending, in a way. Because, yeah, there's like farmers who get paid to heat their pig sheds. Yeah. So they just burn as much biomass as they can. And, and, just to get and biomass actually has the same flue pipe emissions as coal. So it's a broken system. Yeah. Yeah. Any sort of suggestions on my grand idea of a plan? <laughs> I'd love to think that we could, like, my ambition is basically to have a medium term retrofit plan for every house in Davida. Like, because, you know, you don't have to commit to it, you don't have to do it. But if as a community we've got a plan and we know where we're going, like, I, I think that's really useful, so. It's got a comment, and it's, it's carbon payback thing. We need to find a way to do it so that it's not just throwing money at the problem. Because if you, if, at the moment, if you throw 50 grand out of the it's, in emissions terms, just spending all that money. It's a bit like buying, buying 50, 50 grand with a diesel to see it. It is, pretty much. You think about where the money goes. It goes into buying wood, it gets into the forestry and diesel and machinery and energy. Just about everything you spend money on, you're buying energy. At the moment, not much of that energy is, is renewables. So you have to think about where you spend your money, because if we all go out and spend 50 grand a thing, we'll, we'll increase our emissions long before we save the emissions. Yeah. So if we could do it some way where we make use of what we've got better. I mean, I, I'm pulling kind of whole chicken here at the moment. I've got stacks of fiberglass uh, insulation and foam insulation. I'll have enough to fill this room with foam insulation. Cool. Um, so that's, that's a way we Keep can, it. Yeah, <laughs> no, true. 
And that's why I love to think as a community we can work together on things like this. You know, I mean, so you might not meet current fire regulations, but I think we can probably wrap it with a, with a Yeah, you can put it behind plastic or two loads of plastic. Behind plastic. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean there's other strengths that we can have in our community as well, like I mean we talk about disruption, and let's say someone wants to uh, go, go full hog and do the whole retrofit, they're probably going to have to move out. Um, what if the community owned a house in the village that people could move into while their renovation was being done? Because mm -hmm. it only takes three or four weeks, usually, to do an entire re renovation. So, uh, yeah, ideas like that, but also, so you're talking about um, what the industry calls embodied carbon. So that's the emissions from the materials we use. Now the retrofit I'm doing in King Street, the client is really ecologically minded. They do not want to use any fossil fuel based insulation products in their renovation. That's a massive challenge because uh, you know foam board basically performs twice as well as glass wall. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean it's impossible, it just means it's more expensive and a, and a little harder. But yeah, everyone can bring their own values to this and it should be tailored to, to each person in their house, really. Um, but yeah, why are we not shearing all the sheep around here and turning that into wool insulation? <laughs> so if anyone wants to help set that business up, then... All right, have I put everyone off? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, what are we going to get out of this? We've got to do it for the environment. Well, we've got to do it for our, yeah, our children. Not yeah. for us. Yeah. And, yeah. and what we'll save all the year. But I think, I think the biggest stumbling block for most people would just be the, the sheer scale of the cost. Step by step. That's, yeah. by, by learning with that, you might come up with some really clever low cost things. You know, once you figure out, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking of experience in my old snow farmhouse. Um, you do need that sort of way of getting the moisture away from the inside of the walls. If you yeah. can just bore holes in the wall and blow chip, um, newspaper into it, it would be great. But there might be a way to, to put bladders or tubes in or ventilation or something first and then fill the cavities with something that's really quick and easy and cheap. And you might be able to come up with cheaper ways of doing it. Because cheaper also probably means less emissions in doing the job. Yeah, true. And it's, it's maybe affordable then, and you can get good results. You might not get the super duper result, but you might get a hard year of the energy rather than the short of the Yeah, I mean, it's a big challenge because every building is different, and a stone building behaves much, more, much completely differently from a timber frame building. And moisture is the main thing, especially in our climate, we need to be concerned with. Uh, you know, the one thing I would say is that building physics, as it's called, is is actually is, is complex, but it's really well understood. So if you want to go fill in a cavity in a stone house, I know the building rates say that you shouldn't, but if you do the right sort of analysis, it might actually be feasible. But I guess at the moment, the approach I'm kind of taking is that it would be good as a community to identify typologies in our housing to make it transferable from one house to another and you can relate to it a bit easier. But, yeah. well, it's the transfer of knowledge. Somebody over in Holland might have figured out a really clever way of doing it. And through this network, yeah. we can find out that. And yeah. very much away from somebody who can sell you an idea. Yeah. You can find out through the community groups. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. I think possibly um, collaboration with industry as well that could be working. I mean there must be more than one product so the oil and gas industry. I know personally uh, the company I'm involved with has a huge inventory of stuff that may or may not get used. Some of it's aerogel already. So Oh oh my god. Right, okay. So the aerogel is like it was developed for the space industry. Yeah. Uh, it's basically jelly with bubbles in, but you replace the bubbles with a vacuum. Yeah. It's a it's it's, it's, it's expensive phenomenal. but yeah. it's Brilliant for dealing with thermal bridges around windows and stuff like that. So, yeah, wow. and you know, I don't know, fishing maybe, you know, what yeah. do you do with all 
from the sidings and the boxes that they use to transport fish and just kind of thinking around my ideas but we all work in different industries and yeah. you know there could be um, ways to collaborate to use so that we reduce the carbon footprint instead of buying new and we, we can use some of these things in that yeah for sure all right well i've probably taken enough of your time thank you very much if you're interested in just signing up or just being kept more informed about this then uh, please come give me a name and I'll put you on the list. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.